Adab, good evening and thank you for joining in. It's an important occasion for us today. 36th anniversary of the passing away of Khad Ali Beg Sahab. Every year we commemorate it with a commemorative production either by the foundation or by some theatre veteran. If you may recall many stalwarts had come to Hyderabad presenting their works on this day, some of them from overseas even premiering their new works to mark Baba's anniversary. And this year we could have neither. So we decided to pay an online tribute, a tribute with story reading. And why story reading, you may ask? So on this day, please allow me to make an announcement that the Khadr Libek Theatre Foundation is embarking on a new creative endeavor, an added creative pursuit, which is publishing stories and scripts. The Maiden Venture is a collection of short stories by none other than the daughter-in-law of the Doyen Khad Ali Beg Sahab, Noor Beg, who is also an important part of the foundation. The collection of short stories is titled A Quaint a Census. It's a census of acquaintances. And the book will have compiled 10 stories which are about relationships about acquaintances in many people's lives. I trust that we have your support, your blessings in love as you have been giving Khadr Ali Beg Theatre Foundation and the Khadr Ali Beg Theatre Festival in the past decade and a half. I've chosen one story here called Alone because it is pretty relevant in today's times. Alone. Alone. Lights, camera, action. The directors call on a megaphone, the slap of a clapperboard. Applause whistles of audiences in theatres. Autograph, ma'am, ma'am, autograph please. Andi, okanimisham ikada, madam yaha pe mujhe bhi. There are no selfies then. Flashes of cameras snapping on the red carpet. This way, this way, Miss Asha, look this way. Ma'am, here, here, give us a smile. Ma'am, please. Dramatic announcements of anchors at award ceremonies. And the award for the best actress goes to voices throughout her life. There had been so many sounds, so many voices, crowds of people around her. And now under the lockdown, voices continued. Sounds of life persisted, but they more changed. Under the lockdown, she was alone. From her kitchen, she could hear disembodied voices trickling over the high concrete wall, separating hers and the immediate neighbor's house. They were new. She had not met them yet. But she knew them by their voices along with the sound of the pressure cooker whistles. The little daughter, whose young mother always called her name in an irritable, elongated tone. So, ha! The guffaw of an older man over the exaggerated sound effects of a comedy show on television. The joyous shouts of two little boys amid the sound of wax of cricket bats. So with these inhabitants at close quarters, regular faces on Netflix and YouTube, video calls from family and friends, the regular Swiggy and Big Basket delivery boys who could say that during this lockdown, she was alone. Really? What comprises loneliness? Absence of an encircling physical human presence? Or lack of the right kind of companionship? To the objective eye, Asha in her self-isolation had an unenviable combination of both. As she walked slowly down on the length of a hall from the bedroom to the kitchen to make her tea and then back with the mug that had best mother in the world written on it, she listened to the early morning excited chatter of the birds. 
They seem thoroughly enthused to begin the day, announcing their to-do lists to the world. Without her maid and personal assistant, or the spot boy, Asha's own to-do lists overflowed and exhausted her. Although healthy 64, she didn't have the energy she had when she was 21. She gazed out at the blue-green early light that looked the same as the blue-green late evening light, but felt so different. One signified beginning, the other completion. In such light, she could imagine she was back again in Masuri. All those decades ago, training to teach meditation to seekers. She would go for long walks, tracing the edges of the violet hills, feeling part of the landscape without feeling her body separate from it. What a master of my fate, captain of my soul she was in those days, living by herself in a wooden room in Dilaram Palace, along with the other teachers in training. She had shocked her parents by choosing a career of monastic inclinations. She had been the star of a college destined to blaze a trail of fame and fortune. But she had burning questions that would not wait till they were fed answers. Thirsty for water to douse those flames. At one point though, barely a year into her training as a teacher, the almost novitiate became a Hollywood ingenue. During a spiritual discourse at the ashram, she encountered a famous Indian movie star and his glamorous British wife. The young dreamy-eyed mystical young Asha made quite an impression on the star couple. Curious to see what they saw in her, she allowed them to pull her along to meet an even more famous Hollywood director who was travelling across India in the process of making his magnum opus, a fantastical adventure film in the exotic jungles of India. More prosaically, it was a set constructed on the outskirts of Pune. I found my Princess Gala, Academy Award winning director Cecil Cadogan had cried in his Lilton Welsh accent. Costume, turban, footwear, jewellery fittings followed. Thrown into the whirlwind of a massive Hollywood production, starring opposite the action supernova Garrison Lord, Asha left herself be blown around. However, she couldn't help but struggle to comprehend how a princess from Eastern Bengal was to be dressed like a cross between a Shazadi of the Arabian Nights and a Rajasthani Banjaran. She tried to explain this to the costume designer who shrugged and said, That's Hollywood, baby. You're interpreting a fantasy. T Turn this way. Oh my gosh, you have a beautiful profile. I shall learn quickly that she wasn't tired for applying her mind here, but simply for how she looked a certain way in a certain dress. She was good though. It wasn't so much to do with her drama club days at college, but she seemed to know how to deliver a line and how to hold herself with confidence. Samson Brown and the Tropical Palace was released in the summer of 1978. She went to Los Angeles for the premiere. Her first time on a plane. Her first time abroad. She wore a custom-made Bhanu Alaya gown which was draped around her like a toga version of a sari by a professional stylist. Towering in gold stilettos, with a hair piled up in a beehive, she posed for photographs that made it to Vanity Fair's best dressed. It was all very exciting and yet, yet she felt as if she were far removed from it. Like it was happening to someone else and she was just watching, amused. At one more page in the comic book adventure of her life. Despite the depth or lack thereof in a role as Princess Gala, it was this old soul quality of hers that led her to being cast in a venerable Indian author's art film titled The Vidha. The film saw her playing a young intellectual widow. A story of unrequited love which ended melancholically in drought and death. It was her male lead's first venture into serious cinema after dancing around colourful pots atop colourful drums. After months of shooting intense, silent pauses, she sends him working up the courage to confess his feelings towards her. But she definitely managed to change the topic or excuse herself to the lady's room. At that time, she wasn't prepared to be tied down. 
Love didn't figure in her plans, if she had any plans at all. Astonishingly, the movie ended up being both a critical and commercial success. But Asha needed to fulfill her about it a spiritual quest. Her usually taciturn director actually broke down and cried when she declined his next film. An idea that was solely inspired by her. Of course we want you back, Asha. You're one of the finest teachers we have ever had, said a supervisor when she met her back in Masuri. The no-nonsense middle-aged woman gazed deeply into Asha's eyes. Asha expected a condemnation of her deviation into the supposedly degenerate path of movies. But I had a dream, the lady confessed. I dreamt of a master and he never appears in my dreams. He came in my dream to tell you that the ascetic way of life is not for you. You have to go back into the world. Which world? What about the world was real, Asha wondered. The real world was with him. As for the physical world, she didn't want to call up her previous director and didn't know how to get back to films. In the interim, she accompanied a friend to Kerala for a naturopathy retreat. The long robes that Aisha wore during the retreat sessions added to her mystery and caught the attention of a renowned Malayalam filmmaker who was also attending the therapy. He handed over to her fully bound an English translated script of a poetic, naturalistic movie set in Athirapali Falls. Asha couldn't resist the lure of staying near the waterfalls for several months. Dialogues were minimal as the character was a solitary forest dweller, a guardian of the woods, so to speak. And besides, she had a flair for languages. Asha completed this film, which was a huge hit, and went to Venice, Berlin, Cannes. En route to visit her parents between film festivals, press conferences, promotional functions and reading new scripts. She stopped at Hyderabad on an invitation of a producer who was commissioning an action-packed heroine-centric film. However, within the first conversation, she became aware that the theme was less feminist-oriented and more feminine objectifying. She was just wondering how to extricate herself quickly from the dubious situation when divine intervention came in the form of a nail she stepped on at the set and had to be taken hurriedly to get a tetanus shot in the nearby hospital. After the injection at the outpatient department of the large hospital, anticipating the pain to subside, she saw a serious young man in a white coat walking in, observing her. She mentally prepared to run if he recognized her as Princess Gala or the intellectual widow or the nature guardian, throbbing in her soul notwithstanding. He didn't. It hurts, doesn't it? He asked, smiling slightly. She nodded, unsmilingly. We could say the same of life, he commented. She shook her head, realizing that she didn't really know what pain or heartbreak was. The man in the white coat was Lokesh, a doctor, assisting his father who owned the hospital. Just as uneventfully as they met, within a year they married, quietly in a temple ceremony, with a few close friends in attendance, just the way Asha wanted it. Lokesh's father retired and the son took over the hospital. The hospital grew. They built a house. Asha bought a lot of indoor plants and cane furniture for the house. She did one Tamil film which won her rave reviews. Enigmatic Queen of Hearts, the press called her. She did a Telugu film that won her a national award, a special jury award. Astounding mastery of expression, the jury remarked. She liked shooting in Hyderabad, traveling to Ramoji Film City, and coming back home to wash off her makeup and eat quiet, cozy dinners with Lokesh. On weekends, she studied French at the Alliance Francaise only because she was curious about the language, ignoring the star-struck stares of her students and the teacher. Her decent French, combined with a short but powerful filmography, caught the attention of her visiting French director. 
She told Lokesh about the director's offer. The French film to go on floor soon. The role was something to sink teeth into. The international production house was thoroughly professional in the contracts and itineraries they had drawn up for her. The opportunity was rare. But she wasn't sure if she wanted to uproot herself for a year. To commit so deeply, unlike the Indian films where she was far more in control of her schedule. Why don't you go, said Lokesh, barely looking up from his stack of medical journals. The marriage definitely wasn't les affair, but it wasn't much about adoring and pining. She didn't go because soon enough she would give birth to their daughter. And that's when she learned the full meaning of commitment. Tapasya was an easy infant who was tremendously content to play with plastic boxes or bits of string, even though her adoring parents showered her with all the toys, books and clothes she could ever wish for. Asha became submerged in a satisfying, consuming schedule of breakfast, school, lunch, homework, dinner, until Tapasya grew old enough to demand friendship from her mother, which her mother readily gave. Asha felt more fully alive than she ever had been. Someone's mother. A reason for being, no reason to float away. And as her child grew through the ages, she grew through the same ages too. Much to Asha's amusement, Tapasya chose to study filmmaking in college. 22 years after Asha's last film, one of Tapasya's classmates pleaded with her to convince her mother to act in their diploma film. Asha accepted on a lark. She immersed herself in playing a farmer woman whose son chooses to join the army. A salute to patriotism, the film was. Old parts of herself reawakened. Tapasya was thrilled to see her mother playing something beyond being her mother. Asha enjoyed being directed by a young woman for a change. Auntie, you're brilliant, just brilliant, said Tapasya's friend. Her casting coup and Asha's performance helped in part in landing her a job as head filmmaker Kani Rajaratnam's assistant director in Chennai. It was not much later that Asha was playing a real-life widow. Tapasya and she were grief-stricken, firstly through Lokesh's terrible illness and then his demise. But they had each other for a short while. Tapasya's talents were spotted by a Mumbai-based filmmaker and pretty soon she was sharpening her skills as a professional screenwriter and director. First shuttling between Mumbai and Hyderabad and then when a close friend from the industry proposed marriage, only Mumbai. The bond persisted across cities. Asha continued to revel in Tapasya's success. Feeling the same pride in seeing her daughter's name in the credits on screen as she had when she had won first prize in elocution school. But for the first time, Asha understood what Lokesh had meant. Now she truly knew what heartbreak was. She went on. The house had to be maintained. The house that was marked more by absences and less by presence. Tapasya's former classmate visited. Auntie, do you know that Google has hundreds of search results of your name? You're like the crossover star before, much before there were crossover stars. Let me call my friend who's a casting agent. You're wasting your time just sitting at home, auntie. Was she wasting herself? Asha was ambivalent if a role came by or not. She decided that if it did, then she would accept it. But then the nationwide lockdown happened. Stay home. Stay safe. Tapasya was panicking, sobbing at Asha's enforced home alone situation. Friends called up and lectured in pitying tones, advising on how to be safe, not to let anyone inside the house and how to boost immunity levels at her age. You should join my meditation group on Zoom, darling. Every day they're giving us talks on magnetic field therapy, craft of living, blah, blah, blah. I'm so busy, I've been making uh, banana bread with my grandson. Isn't it terrible being alone 
someone asked, stopping short of saying, I feel sorry for you. Yes, it was far from wonderful being alone for two whole months, but it was what it was. The only time she lashed out was an old friend of hers and Lokesh commented, this is why you should have had a son. He would have stayed with you. With cold fury, she replied, I pity sons whose parents see them as commodity investments. Tapasya is more than a son or daughter to me. She is my world and I am grateful that she simply exists in my life as my child, as a daughter. Her lead role had been as Tapasya's mother. The rest of the time she had fitted flitted through various parts she had played that had led to larger jigsaw, though not a complete puzzle. All versions of herself, whatever that was, she had donned so many hats, gone to so many places, seen so many things, so many voices, so many conversations, so many people, glamour, glories, accolades, celebrity, stardom, accomplishments, awards. She could travel a whole universe by visiting the many personalities that she had been inside. In fact, everything was inside. Universes abounded, rainbow hues streaked across the solar system and stars sparkled. Bubbles of wisdom emerged, inner truths glistened like dewdrops on leaves evaporating as swiftly as they appeared. Realization amidst a regular life was transitory, after all. It had to be worked on again and again, day after day. A spiritual awareness accumulating as much as it got simpler and simpler, that everything was one and she was everything. But the only truth was love. And when the lockdown lifted and Tapasya called her breathlessly, that's it, mummy, it's over, we're coming, you're never going to be alone again, mama. Asha smiled, truly delighted, but said, Can't wait, my darling. But alone, I never was. Alone by Norbeck.